This is Catholic Forum. I'm Bob Krebs. Benedictine sister Laura Swan is a member of the St. Placid Priory in Lacey, Washington. She holds degrees from Franciscan University and also from uh, the uh, Seattle University. She has published numerous books and articles, including The Forgotten Desert Mothers, Sayings, Lives, and Stories of Early Christian Women, uh, which is now in its second edition. Joining us now from St. Placid Priory in Lacey, Washington, is Sister Laura Swan. Sister, welcome to Catholic Forum. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. Um, we're going to be talking about this book, which is which I think you wrote, what, like 20 years ago? Is that right, Sister? Yes. And but it's now uh, republished in, its, in an updated version. Uh, before we get yeah. into that, Sister, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would, please, and in your call to the monastic community. Well, it was a call that certainly surprised me. I owned a home in downtown Bellevue, which is uh, a due east of Seattle, and um, active in church, active elsewhere, uh, had actually expected to get married, but that didn't happen, and went on a retreat with friends. Uh, to Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon, and then to St. Placid Priory. And I was really drawn to the fact that Benedictines uh, seek God through beauty, through the arts, through music, through literature. And that was the uh, really the spirituality of my parents. They wouldn't have called it that, but uh, from a young age, they were draw, uh, taking us to, you know, concerts in the park, to a theater, to... Um, museums to uh, gaze at art and they really embodied that as the beauty as an access to the divine and um so then um you became uh interested in um in the monastic life and uh, when did you when did you enter uh the order yeah I one of the things that really drew me to St. Placid, and it happened everywhere, I just didn't know it at the time, is uh, women presiding at prayers and creating the Liturgy of the Hour and um, chanting the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, I began the process about 1988 and moved in in 1989. Um, so I'm beyond my Silver Jubilee. Uh, much to my surprise, the Holy Spirit moves how she wills. Uh, two years after I made final profession in 1996. So in 1998, I found myself elected prioress of my community, which is kind of extraordinary. But I knew what spirit was calling us to, and I knew what amongst my few talents uh, was what spirit wanted to use uh, at that time. Um, and so I had kind of a quick indoctrinate, indoctrination into uh uh, monastic life and have really found it, although days challenging, uh, to be a really enriching life for me. You know, it's not for everyone, but uh, I have found it to be very enriching. So, Sister, how did the Forgotten Desert Mothers come about? Uh, Sister Lucy is becoming famous because I keep starting with her. She was my uh, monastic history teacher, and monastic history does begin in the desert because Benedict of Nursia, who wrote a rule, which is not a legal document, it's a spiritual document, and he had no sense that his rule was going to end up becoming the standard for monasticism in Western Europe. Uh, but he was heavily uh, um, embedded in desert spirituality and tradition. So we begin history class with the desert in the about 250-300 is um, where Sister Lucy began. And she kept telling me stories of these great, colorful, wonderful men. And without even thinking about it, I kept asking, well, where are the women? Where are the women? And she got frustrated at me one day and she said, go out and find them yourself. So it kind of became a uh, quiet hobby of mine to go digging around to try to find, because the literature said women outnumbered two, the men two to one, and then back to telling the stories of the men. So I just had this file that was growing and growing and growing of stories and sayings and whatever I could find. One day I was talking to an Episcopal church on Celtic spirituality, and I happened to mention that the desert ascetics 
uh, when uh, the desert was getting too crowded, as they considered it, they moved to the ends of the earth, which in those days was the west of Ireland. And they moved out there. They're famous for these beehive-shaped um, cells that they built with rock um, and continued their life there. And a woman came up to me afterwards, and she and I have no idea who she is. And she said, where'd you find the mothers? And I said, oh, I have this file, and I find one here, and I find one there, and I save it and put it in my file. And she looked at me, and she said, you're going to write a book. And I knew she was absolutely right, and I had no idea how to go about writing a book. And it took a few more years of journeying these, with these women and continuing to research before I figured out how to tell their story. And one of the things that intrigues me is that desert ascetics, men including besides the women, were deeply connected with other parts of the church. Um, although romantically, the stories get, you know, Ama so-and-so went out into the desert and she found a cave and she never saw people again. And she sat out there and, you know, memorized the scripture and prayed morning, noon, and night. But then you really find out people came to her for spiritual direction. She was uh, weaving rope, which was actually kind of one of the core things for the Roman economy. They'd go in once a month to the village and sell their product and buy what they needed. And the first thing they did was to give the first 10% of whatever they earned to the local deacon, who might be a woman or a man. And their job was to use the money to take care of widows and orphans and prisoners and, you know, the things that deacons do do still to this day uh, and then back out into the desert. But they were connected to monastic communities who knew where Amma so-and-so was or where Abba so-and-so was, where, which cave was there. So they could keep an eye out for them. Um, oftentimes the desert ascetic ended up getting um, convinced to start and oversee a monastic community. They didn't particularly want to do that, but, you know, if spirit moves you to do something, you know, hopefully we follow the spirit's lead. Um, and from there, John Cashin brought desert spirituality, the stories of all these great people to uh, Southern France. It was called Gaul then, and that's where Benedict picked it up. So how would you describe then the desert spirituality? Would it be um, it's not necessarily all just being alone, but that's a great part of it. If you had to sum it, it up, is, how, would, how would you do that? Sure. Um, the desert spirituality really is about interior simplicity. It's about removing all the barriers, emotional baggage, um, attitudes from the past that keep us from a deep and personal encounter with God. And so some oftentimes going to the desert meant letting go of uh, family trappings, obligations. Now I'm not talking about abandoning young children, but um, mm -hmm. going out into the desert was first step of letting go of everything. And then realizing actually the letting go and the work we do is interior. And so the desert just became a place to um, be free to work on our inner attitudes, uh, deepening in our knowledge of scripture. They were still great readers of uh, philosophy and histories and other literature out there, as well as collecting um, the homilies of bishops and, you know, favorite preacher, uh, preachers out there um, to feed their soul and uh, um, help confront them on what it is they still need to let go of that keeps them from yet a deeper loving relationship with God. And their experience of God was very positive, not negative. And it's during a certain period of time in our history, correct? Yeah, really, you know, we still have desert aesthetics today. I focused on about 250 to 600 because, of course, my editor wanted the book to come to an end one day, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, but, you know, the Franciscans originally were women as well as men were um, carrying forward the tradition of the desert. But desert aesthetics were there when Islam passed through and desert ascetics continued. Islam actually had great respect for uh, these desert seekers. But I want to mention that the desert wasn't always just out in the middle of Egypt or Asia Minor where there weren't very many people, um, especially women oftentimes turned a part of their family estate into a, a cell just for themselves with limited contact with the family. Some of them moved into mausoleums with this idea of preparing for death, and, but they would still open up the grill to counsel people who would come to them with 
questions or problems or, you know, whatever. My guest today on Catholic Forum is Sister Laura Swan, and we're talking about uh, her book, uh, Desert Mothers, The Forgotten Desert Mothers, um, Sayings, Lives, and Stories of Early Christian Women. Sister, give us a few, uh, tell us about a few of these women. Um, give us a name and, and tell us a little bit about them, if you would, please. I sure will. Um, we have the sayings for four Amas, and then we have stories of the lives of uh, many more, but we, their uh, sayings or their teachings didn't survive. One is Amma Sarah, who is one of the great desert ascetics, i.e. Um, a lot of people knew of her and came to her. And she has this one saying, and I'm quoting, it was related of Amma Sarah that for 13 years she waged warfare against the demon of sexual sin. She never prayed that the warfare should cease, but she said, oh God, give me strength. And what scholars tell us is that the desert ascetics, men and women, didn't want the demonic um, temptations to go away. And, you know, modern times we might interpret the demons that they're dealing with, you know, in psychological terms, but also the reality of evil. But desert ascetics considered these demons, however you want to think of them, as being essential to their interior journey, that these impulses confronted them that caused them to draw closer to God in order to um, deal with them and to move beyond them. You know, St. Paul, you know, I pray that uh, this one burden would be lifted from me, but God has decided not to remove it. Of course, I'm not doing an exact quote, but it's that same idea that that wound, that weakness, that temptation is often the place where the Holy Spirit is able to slip in and touch us deeply and draw us closer to God. Of course, you know, one of the things is it teaches us compassion for others. So people coming to Amos Sarah would re uh, experience a woman who is deeply compassionate about their own temptations, their own challenges, their own woes that they're carrying around with them. Um, another one whom I also is Amos and Cletica, and there's actually two Cycleticas. So I'm quoting from the major one. I mean, that's how scholars have uh, named them. Alma Sincletica said, there are many who live in the mountains and behave as if they were in the town, and they are wasting their time. It is possible to be solitary in one's mind while living in a crowd, and it is possible for one who is a solitary to live in the crowd of personal thoughts, i.e., again, it's internal, not external, that I can be up on a mountaintop but have this cocktail party going um, <laughs> that distracts me, disrupts me, you know, so when um, we teach Christian meditation, um, contemplative prayer, I talk about um, letting the cocktail party just be up there, just don't engage all the my memories and things that are uh, going on up there, and move down deep within your being uh, to that place that is quiet, and it does then doesn't matter what's going on around you. Uh, running away to the mountaintop is not going to make all that noise and those voices go away until we move deeper within ourselves to where our real self dwells. So I, I guess you could uh, say that you you shouldn't you don't really have to go to the desert. You take the desert with you, so, you know, so to speak. You can live in the desert right where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is that as we draw closer to the divine, we naturally become more compassionate. Um, using our modern term, you know, more committed to social justice, it transforms us within. And so we can just bring the desert with us wherever we go, wherever we live. When you were researching this book, uh, Sister, uh, was there anything that you learned that uh, particularly surprised you? Well, I jokingly call that my research on the desert mothers, my third novitiate, uh, wow. Graduate school was my second novitiate, and then my novitiate was my novitiate, i.e. training in the monastic life. Um, I think surprises for me included how earthy uh, and how real the desert ascetics are, the women and the men, of how many different expressions of an ascetic lifestyle were emerging out of the early Christian movement, because we are really talking about a time when the New Testament is coming together, when the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed was uh, starting to come together. So Christianity was still trying to figure out who we were and how we were and, you know, our call and then dealing with empire. And we have empire today. 
So how do we live alongside without being part of it? Um, the values of empire that are contrary to the teachings of the church, which they're living at a time when the teachings of the church are still being clarified and tested out and argued over. And because uh, there was a lot of argument in the early church, um, sometimes it kind of got sort of brutal between, uh, between people who had pretty strong feelings about. Um, and our desert ascetics did contribute to the whole um, discussion around how Jesus could be fully human and fully divine um, through letters. Uh, sometimes they went into Alexandria or uh, Constantinople and went before the bishop or the theologians and expressed their understanding of whatever this question is they're working with and then back out to their cave again. Why do you think, Sister, that um, we haven't heard more about, about these women? Is it because the church and society is male dominated or are there, or is it more uh, complex than that? Uh, it's probably fairly complex. Um, unfortunately, the church does have a history of dismissing women as not being fully human, of not having much to share, of not being capable of um, understanding scripture, preaching, teaching, um, but it never died out. Regardless of what official teachings were, it never died out. And historians can be blamed. Um, I mean, the ones I'm thinking of are dead. Uh, but for decades, I mean, for centuries, they were perpetuating a tired old story about women and what little we contributed to Christianity. You know, we Mary gives birth to the Son of God and, you know, maybe one or two women in the early church did something and kind of just dismissed us for centuries. And... Um, it's these scholars that young men and women in about 1975 or 80 who started going back and digging through the original sources. And they started noticing all the women that were there that just were not getting written into the history books. And in some cases, uh, early scribes changed a woman's name to the man male form and declared that her teachings were written by the sky when in fact, even... Um, one of the women apostles mentioned in the uh, New Testament, they altered her name to a male version and for centuries passed her off as a hymn. Well, what do you want your list, your readers to take away from this book? That first and foremost, um, God desires a really deep relationship with each one of us as individuals, no matter our culture, language, you know, whoever we are, that, um, there is a path that uh, the teachers who have gone before us have shown and you know have proven to be effective, which is, around, as I said, around this interior simplicity about recognizing the abundance of God, um, of humility, which is not about humiliation. It's about being teachable. It's about saying, I know some things and I have things to learn. I'm just mm -hmm. shoulder to shoulder with other people. And through that, spirit works through each one of us to touch the world around us. Uh, so the teachings of the desert ascetics are very relevant today. And I think that's why they started coming back around the, in the 1980s. And it was the Episcopalian women who really popularized the desert fathers. And from there, um, I stepped in, didn't realize this would have such the impact that it did um, to fill out the story. Tell us just briefly, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, what's, what's a typical day like at, uh, at St. Placid uh, Priory? Well, it's framed out with prayer, of course, um, because we don't need to be anywhere at the crack of dawn. Um, morning prayer for us starts at 8 a.m. And then we have uh, noon praise and then mass at 5 o'clock and evening praise at 6.45. Um, of course, uh, lunch and dinner in between is shared, you know, as a community. But each one of us uh, has different responsibilities and ministries. And so it's up to each one of us to make time for private prayer um, and for study and whatever. We have artisans in our house, not my gift, but we have some artisans in our house and we've kind of uh, have an informal studio for them to work in. Uh, we can sort of what, see what I spend some of my time doing. And I do teach part-time at our local Benedictine University. And I'm the archivist, so I'm digging into our past and trying to preserve it. And we've been out here since 1892, and most people don't even know we're here. Well, oh, well. There's, there's, always, <laughs> there's always plenty to do, I'm sure, right, sister? 
Oh, there sure is. Yeah, yeah. Sister, how can our listeners and their viewers um, get a copy of your book? It's through Paulist Press, which is a mm -hmm. fairly major Catholic publisher. So really, mm -hmm. uh, not just Catholic bookstores, but any bookstore could order it if they don't already have it on their shelf. It's pretty easy to get your hands on because Paulist Press is a major uh, Catholic mm -hmm. press. Right. And it's also available probably at the local Catholic bookstore and through Amazon. Oh, yeah. I'd hope those so. Places as well, right? Yeah, the title yeah. is The Forgotten Desert Mothers, Sayings, Lives, and Stories of Early Christian Women by Sister Lara Swan. Sister, thanks so much for being with us on Catholic Forum. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Bob. And you take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.